Welcome to Great News for the World. Friend, have you ever signed a contract or become involved in an agreement where you had to sign your name underneath a whole lot of, of clauses of fine print, which were called the conditions? Well, you may know that if you hadn't read those conditions first, that it could be very damaging. It could involve great personal embarrassment and not a little financial loss. Well, if you're considering the rewards, the very priceless, great rewards the Bible offers people, then it's important for you to understand the conditions. My name is Frank Abel. My guest is Mr. Ron Abel. Together, we'd like to tell you about them. In the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, the Bible states, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Well, there's an example of one of the conditions. Now, the Bible talks about being saved, as if everyone understood what we're being saved from. Let me just go over that a little minute. We, first of all, must understand the Bible's teaching about the way life is. Now, we could learn this if we would believe what happens when we see things, animals, or other people die, that the, the corpse is there, lifeless. All the attributes that we associate with life, respiration, movement, thinking, emotions, it just is not occurring. What the Bible states, my friend, is that is exactly the way it is, that death ends life. Hence the words saved in the Bible is to save us from an everlasting death, a non-ending condition of unconsciousness. But even more than that, when the Bible speaks of being saved, if we are saved from that unconsciousness of death, we are saved to immortality, to a body that cannot die, to a reward which we will try to develop for you is something really worth living for. Not the least of which, my friend, is that if you understand these things and follow the Bible teaching, you find it, it's certainly worthwhile now. But... Again, coming back to the point of the verse we've read, the Bible says that we're saved if we keep in memory the things which were taught. Now think about that for a moment. If the Bible says we're saved by keeping in memory, why does it say that? Is there any advantage to us to be able to recite when we wake up in the morning what the Bible message is? Is there any advantage to us in being able to recite when someone asks us, say the Beatitudes, or some of the more well-known psalms? No, I don't think so. That's not what the writer meant, that we're saved by keeping in memory the gospel message. The way God has ordained his word and mankind is that people who believe the word of God would have their lives change. And as a result of changing their life, then, of course, they would, at the appropriate time, be given immortality. That's the whole point. God doesn't give immortality to people who haven't followed the conditions. And the conditions is that in the opportunities that life presents for us, time, energy, and resources, that we might use that to develop a character worth saving. Well, Ron, maybe you can identify the process for us a little better. Well, Frank, uh, in the Bible, uh, we read very clearly that there is one faith, one hope, and one baptism. In fact, time and again, Paul in his epistles speaks about the truth which ought to be believed for salvation. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul spoke about the goodness of God. Peradventure, he would give the believer repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So, salvation, friends, relates to the truth. And as Frank has pointed out, it's a process. It's not something that's instantaneous. The process may be outlined as follows. 
salvation deals with knowing. A man that understandeth not is like the beast that perish. But a person has to understand, to know the truth of the gospel message. He must count the cost of what it's like to be a disciple, being prepared to forsake mother and father and lands for the, na for the sake of Jesus Christ. He must change. There must be personal repentance on his part, and God must forgive his sins. The candidate for salvation, he must also obtain the reward. The reward to be obtained is that reward that Paul said was laid up for him at that day when God would give to him, and not to him only, but to all those who believed, life eternal in the great and glorious kingdom of our Heavenly Father. So friends, you see, salvation is not something that's instantaneous, like the uh, momentary raising of a hand upon uh, a feeling of, of great humbleness before the Word of God. That may be a beginning, but salvation is a process that you have to work out being prepared to count the price, to persevere, because as Jesus said, he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. And then, of course, Frank, there's a great prospect of life forever as an immortal in God's great kingdom on the earth. That is indeed a, a great hope, but we have to realize the way to get to that great hope is a process. It's a, it's a point worth making, Ron. And I believe that it should be emphasized as much as possible in the brief time that we have to be able to speak to you about this topic. Because the great news for the world is really involved in all of the things that contribute now to finally bring that to fruition in our life. If we think that we have already been saved, nothing else to do but wait for it, well, then we think of the passages that the Bible speaks of, of where people will be greatly surprised. In fact, surprised, the Bible speaks in terms of weeping and gnashing of teeth anguish of soul. They thought they knew what was right, they thought they were doing what was right, but they were wrong. Now the Bible gives us that picture. It's not a picture that we have sort of uh, thought of just for this program to impress the point. Now the point is made by the Bible. Now it goes on to tell us something, to give us the reasons why salvation is conditional. In the epistle of Paul to the Philippians, chapter 2, and we look there in the second chapter at verses 12 and 13, we will see something else concerning the conditions of salvation. It says, Wherefore, my brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Interesting how that the, the Bible would speak in these terms. I mean, th those terms today are not very popular, that we should ever approach God in fear or we should work in the surroundings of fear. But there's a very good reason why the Bible does speak of fear. If you go and look at some of the teachings in the Proverbs, another part of the Bible, it mentions there that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. There's where people must begin. If a person doesn't have any respect for God, doesn't fear God, doesn't consider that God has the authority and the power to uh, change things immediately like he has in the past, then how can these words have any influence, have any impact on a person's life? So to work out one's salvation with fear and trembling is teaching us that we first of all respect God for who he is. And then, as another part of the Bible says, that those who come to God must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of diligent service. So a person must respect that God will reward them for the diligent service that they are willing to put to his word and to his service. Now, what does this do for us? You know, so often in, in human terms, if a person wants the end effect, he says, well, look, you've got to work for it. You've got to do three days work, and uh, when you've got that done, the house is standing, and, and there we've got our objective. 
that's human terms, and that's all we can really expect from, from human terms. But God has so designed our salvation that when we approach him with fear and reverence, when we look at his word and we really allow it to move us and change us, we find that all the process, no longer, you know, we don't talk in terms of days, we talk in terms of a lifetime, the whole lifetime process is for our benefit. We draw closer to God. We find it easier to do these things until finally the objective that God had in saying these things to us is achieved. You know, it, it's a wonderful thing because God could have made us like robots if he'd wanted to. He could have made us all so that we had no alternative but to serve him perfectly. God, give us the choice. And you see in the world around you, as I see in the world around me, people exercising their choice one way and people another way. But I can't help but understand and believe that when the Bible talks that we were created, we were designed, and God had a purpose in us that it is right. And believing that leads me to make a decision that is only one way in our life. Now, look at this. In the book of Galatians, in the fifth chapter, and at verses 22 to 24, we find some very interesting things concerning the object of God in working out our salvation. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. Well, there is an idea of what God's trying to achieve in us. Now, everybody knows about joy. Everybody seems to know about, about peace and about long-suffering and gentleness. But do you know about them in the way that God speaks of them here? Look, the joy that comes to one who really believes these things and follows the teaching of God is far beyond any joy that you can experience in just human terms. The goodness, the gentleness, the long-suffering that comes from a belief and a following of God's teaching is not to be compared with anything that man knows. So that when God says, look, you're saved conditionally, and you're saved if you work out your salvation in conjunction with my aid, and in particular, the aid he gives us in his word. When we allow that word to influence us, it changes us. It prepares us for God's objective with us to give us eternal life. Now, that, my friend, is certainly worth changing for. It's certainly worth considering very sincerely in one's life. Well, that's one of the conditions, just a few of the things that God mentions. Ron, maybe you can give us another of the conditions. Well, you know, Frank, <clears throat> in the Bible, um, there are a number of conditions for salvation that are set out. There's a part of the Bible, for example, that says we are saved by works, not by faith alone. Another part of the Bible speaks about the importance of obedience in being saved, of grace. All of these are components that are essential in the process of being saved. But you know, friends, there's one very, very important point that we ought not to miss. You know, many people in life expect God to work by miracle, what he expects you to work by muscle. Now think about that, friends. Have you ever thought that the Bible really sets out a, a, a case where you have to save yourself? Well, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. Now, in this part of the Bible, we read, Take heed unto thyself, and unto the doctrine continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now, friends, who was Paul writing to? You know, Paul was writing to his dearly beloved son in the faith, Timothy. Timothy had been a convert when the apostle Paul met him in the Derby Lister area. And he became a very valued companion of the Apostle Paul in his missionary journeys. And yet Paul wrote him some years after he'd been baptized and come into the divine family and said to him, Continue in the doctrine, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself. 
and them that hear thee. So you see, friends, salvation is a process, true enough, but it involves personal effort on your part as it did on the part of Timothy. Was Timothy saved in a momentary experience? There would have been no reason for the Apostle Paul to write him, to tell him to continue in these things, that he might save himself and those that hurt him. Now, similarly, this particular point is not only found in Paul's writings. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, we have the great Pentecost address by the Apostle Peter. And in this address, the Apostle, the Apostle Peter spoke to Jews who had gathered from all of the nations around to keep the great feast. And here he said, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. These were the words that, that Jesus, that, that Peter addressed to Jews who had been religious people, and he told them, save yourselves from this untoward generation. So you see, friends, when you look at the whole process of salvation, there is something that God expects you to work by muscle. You must assume the initiative to understand and to know that you might save yourself. You know, many people think that the real solution to salvation is to pray to God. Friends, it's important to pray to God for wisdom. But remember, when you pray to God, you are talking to Him. When God speaks to you through His Word, He's talking to you. You must understand the conditions of salvation. In the Epistle of Romans, chapter 8, we have there the Apostle Paul again emphasizing the importance of hope. And here we read, in verse uh, 24, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? So you see, friends, in the process of salvation, you are saved by hope, like you are by works, like you are by grace, by obedience. All of these are essential components and it's unfortunate, friends, that we live in the, in the age today where we have instant cereal. We have uh, instant meals. But, you know, we can't have instant salvation. Because the Almighty is the one that has set the standards for salvation. And one of the standards that he has set is that you must save yourself. It's not the only thing, friends, but it's a very important component in ultimately being saved. Thank you, Ron. That's, uh, it's most interesting to consider these things in, in the light of various backgrounds that people may have. Uh, one of the ones I thought would be interesting to consider, too, in this light, is the background of people who may think, well, you know, I've, I've got the hope of the Bible. I, I really believe that's true. I believe you're saved by hope, and I, I think you've got to work out your salvation, and I think it's important to understand doctrine, and I, I think I do. You know, it's not long before you think, well, boy, I'm abiding by all the conditions. I'm not bad. And that can lead a person into a situation of maybe not verbatim saying this, but inward feeling, yes, I am saved. I've, I've, I've followed all the criteria. Well, look, there's one passage I'd like you to at least know about and refer to, and that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. On this topic, it mentions... In the early verses where there was a division in the early Corinthian church and some people were following Paul and some were following Apollos and some were following Peter and they forgot the fact they were really all following Jesus Christ. And Paul's reply to that situation was, look, I don't know anything against myself. I can't think of the sins I've committed, but I'm not thereby acquitted. He goes on to say that my judge is Jesus Christ, and the day of judgment is yet in the future. Let things rest until we will have praise and honor of Jesus Christ. And they're great words because they caution us all against thinking that our salvation is already achieved. There's nothing else for us to do. Look at this reference. In Hebrews chapter 6, at verses 4 to 6, it talks about people in the first century, and it mentions... For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, were made partakers of the Holy Spirit, 
and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. And the significance of the Apostle's remark was this, that here were people who had got into the church, and they had been accepted, they were teaching the things that were right, they had been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and then they had fallen away. It's possible to fall away. But in their falling away, it says they denied the very basis of their acceptance. And so he says, in a sense, they have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ afresh. All the things that were taught them in the death of Jesus Christ, they have denied in turning away from him. Now that's possible. That turning away, that denial of the Lord is possible until, of course, we have died and our life is complete before our judge. And so we should always keep that in mind. And I think that this point is really so important, the understanding between feeling one saved and the ideas the Bible presents of being able to know that uh, the Word of God is to affect eternal life in you, that this is something worth telling the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we would now like to answer a question which relates to eternal life. We'd like to explain why the Bible seems to speak of two things in terms of eternal life. The Bible definitely says that salvation is conditional, yet the Bible goes on to say that a believer can know he has eternal life. Now, we've tried to show in this example here how those two can be considered consistent. First of all, we might say humanity is like the drowning man. Unless we are saved by something, we will ultimately die. Now, here's a lifesaver which is capable in being at least instrumental in this person being saved. If someone throws him the lifesaver and he holds on, he can be saved. Well, we consider that if he grabs the lifesaver, then we might say he is saved. That is the way the Bible says you can know you have eternal life. If you believe it, then the word of God is powerful enough to save you. But you must hold on, and you must stay holding on until one is finally pulled out of the deep water of his impending death until he is on the ground again. So we feel that analogy can show forth the example of how one can be saved in these conditions. Well, there you are. You see, it's, it's something that we have to shout out very loudly that people might understand their obligations from the point of view of God's Word, that they might understand that the Word of God, as it mentions, is like a seed. It's a seed which grows. The Word of God in, in the first epistle of Paul, or first epistle of Peter, rather, the first chapter, it tells us that we should be born again of the Word. Now, if one's born of the Word, it implies a birth, a beginning. He goes on in the second chapter to say that we should seek to grow by the word. Desire the sincere milk of the word is the words he uses. So we must understand there is a growth that the Bible speaks of that's necessary. God didn't expect us to change overnight. He knew we couldn't, knowing who we are because he made us, he knew we couldn't overnight be completely different. That this would be something that one would have to work at. And so we do work out our salvation based on the fact that we know there's no doubt that what God has said is able to affect that salvation is sure. And we'd like to show you that. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, there it will indicate to you in the Bible that it's possible. For instance, it says, Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Now, that's exactly what God wants us to see by it. He wants us to know that the process that he has selected for the salvation of all mankind, if they will, is one that cannot be faulted if only we will comply to allow it to build up to that in our life. Ron, how about the tenses of salvation as the Bible mentions it? Well, Frank, many people come to me in their great sincerity and say, Ron, are you a saved man? Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? And I say to these sincere people, in what sense do you mean saved? The Bible speaks of the past tense of being saved, as in 2 Timothy chapter 1, God who hath saved us 
when a believer appropriates the work of the Lord Jesus Christ at baptism, he is accepting the great plan that God has for salvation. Then there's the present tense in which salvation is used. The present tense is indicated by such passage as God added to the community of believers such as should be saved. The continuous tense, the present tense of being saved, like the building being erected. And lastly, there is the future tense of being saved. The Bible says, he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. And so we must wait for the final judge, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Salvation, there's a plan, there's a building, there's a reward. There is a past tense of being saved, the present continuous tense, and the future tense. May it be our lot to uh, be approved of the Almighty when his great judge, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall ultimately provide the verdict on whether we are saved ultimately or not. Thank you, Ron. That's a very important point, I'm sure, to remember, that there, there is these tenses so that when one is reading the Bible and we come across these passages which seem to indicate just quite different what we're saying, that there is this Bible viewpoint of how salvation occurs. And so may we summarize and say that there is some conditions to be considered when one ponders the rewards that the Bible mentions can be ours by following the teachings of Jesus Christ. These rewards are priceless, absolutely priceless. Not only in what they predict will come upon this earth for us, but in what they have to offer now. It is something certainly worth getting serious about and putting one's time on. It's something that we should look at in the light of, well, as one person in the Bible said, what must I do to be saved? And of course, it was believing these things. Now, one can't believe without knowing them, and one can't believe without thinking and pondering over them, and one can't be saved without going through the process of publicly claiming this through one's baptism and following this out as the word describes it, overcoming unto the end. When Jesus Christ will come back to fulfill all these promises of this time to come and when he will reward those who in faith have looked forward to these things. So we ask you to get the word of God out. Read it. Ponder it. The Bible says prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. May God bless your study of his word.